Hey, welcome. In this video, I'm just going to be going through the death of the automated webinar report that you got. And the reason I want to go through it verbally as well is just for those who maybe like to learn with video better, but also so I can give you a little bit of background on um, you know what we did and a little commentary on, on uh, the content of this report. Now, I, I have to say that honestly, it really does tick me off that people use automated webinars, mostly because you know I want content on my schedule, not on theirs. And as you'll read in the report, you know, a lot of people that are using automated webinars use them because of this idea that you can then capture attention because you're using a fixed point in time. And I think that's a great sales pitch. You know, I admire the people that came up with that, but the reality is much different from that. I mean, the first problem is we're only getting like 20% of the people who register to actually show up to an automated webinar at the scheduled time. That's pretty bad. But what makes it even worse is because we're forcing them into our container, usually with not much heads up, most of the time they're not fully paying attention anyways. And that's kind of one of the problems that we have when we start using uh, these automated webinars. And so we, we fool ourselves into thinking that we're going to have uh, this great engagement with people because the 20% the at least that do get on, which you know for some reason we're grateful for, they're really focused in and paying attention, but we know the fact that matters. Most of them are not. They're totally distracted, doing two things at once, playing the the webinar in the background. Because we've all done it, right? Hopefully, I mean, if you've jumped on any webinars because you want to learn something new, sometimes that's what happens because you got so much other stuff that you've got to get to that you know we just get play it in the background. That just doesn't work. And then there's this uh, the idea that okay, so I got. 100 people to register for my automated webinar. Okay, only 20% showed up, but I got the email address of the other 80%. I'll just send them emails and I'll get them to jump onto the webinar. And the reality is, is we really formed no connection in that short interaction. And so the power of our emails to actually get opened and read and consumed is not really high. And that's the reality of the situation. I know we sometimes don't like to deal with reality because it causes us to have to figure out another solution. But the upside of this um, video is that you're going to get the the solution. So you don't have to worry about that part. So let's just accept the fact that 80% of the people that register for our automated webinars not even showing up sucks. I mean, we shouldn't sugarcoat it because then we can't really address it. And the worst part is, is we put them through all the work of, you know, seeing our ad, clicking on our ad, waiting for our landing page to load, reading our landing page copy, then having to choose a date and a time, and then give us their email address, and then getting on the thank you page, and then realizing, you know, I'm not even going to be able to attend this because it's at a time that's really not convenient for me. And as a result, we're dead. We're dead to them at that point. They're not giving us a second chance. When they see our ads again, if they even remember them in the first place, because as soon as you guys... It's important to remember how the human mind works. The human mind receives so much information, which is more true now than it ever was because of all of the access we have to information from these little pocket computers we call smartphones. In addition to our laptop and whatever other method we're using for getting all this information off the internet. Well, with all that information, what's happened is we've come really adapted it to leading information, meaning our short-term memory clears out very quickly if there's no payoff for us. So when people come into your ad and they see and they go through all this process and they realize, oh, I don't get any payoff out of it, we hope that they won't have any real strong, intense emotion that's negative because then they'll remember us in a bad way. Um, but most likely what's going to happen is they're just going to forget you entirely. And if they see you again, there'll be some part of their mind that will say, I don't do that because that's not even going to give you what you want. And so that, and the worst part about all of this is we're paying for that to happen. So we're paying for 80 of the 100 people who, you know, become leads to ignore us or delete us from their, their mental state. And that's not good for us at all. So <clears throat> before we get into what the actual solution is, I wanted to lay kind of a framework or um, a foundation for us to build on so we could have some mutual uh, concepts that we agree about. So that it, as I present to you this new methodology, you can say, oh, okay, that makes sense. I can follow why that works. And maybe it's not super critical to know why it works, but it can be helpful as you try and modify and customize to your own business because you'll understand the, the principles that kind of direct why we went about it this way and then why it worked for us. So <clears throat> the first concept is frame modification. So everybody has this context of facts and, uh, well, they aren't actually facts. They're things that we assume are facts, you know, our, our perception of reality. And 
there's a bunch of assumptions that are part of that, and that creates this frame that gives everything meaning or context that we see or hear about or interact with. And that frame, and it's different for different situations or context of our life, um, dictates our behavior, dictates our choices, the things that we do and don't do. And understanding this concept is really important because sales and marketing really is a modification of frame. We're modifying a prospect's frame so that it can be adaptive to accepting the call to action that we're making in our sales and marketing. And understand that's really critical because that's really the work that we're trying to do with webinars. Webinars is one of the most powerful media channels to be able to communicate with somebody and to be able to give them, uh, you know, help them feel feelings and give them information that will help them to modify their own frame. And that's the other important part is you have a frame, I have a frame, but I can't change your frame. I can guide you through the process of modifying your own frame, but you have to change your own frame. Now, you don't do that consciously. It just happens as you get information and you accept or reject it. But that frame modification has to occur in order for you to make different choices in your life that would align with the offer that I'm going to make to you or you're going to make to your prospect. So we need that communication to occur. And webinar is great or video is great like the one you're experiencing right now because it allows me to articulate to you in a way where you can pick up on my tone, you can pick up on my inflections, you can pick up on uh, my knowledge, and maybe you can get some concept of, is Ryan trustworthy? Should I believe the things that he's communicating in this report? And that, that can't be done with email or any other text-based media because it doesn't have all that emotion. So video is super powerful. And that's why we use webinars is because it gives us an opportunity to communicate in a way that's very high bandwidth. And you know, we use that term frequently when we think about, you know, internet or video or something like that. But when you think about communication, the amount of information that's transmitted through video is incredible. And so that's why it's such a powerful medium. We want to be utilizing that. And the, the reason we're wanting to utilize it because we're wanting to help someone modify their own frame. So again, I mentioned here in the report, going back to that, that theory that if we can get somebody to show up at a specific time, that then we might be able to isolate them from other distractions. And now what we think we're going for sometimes is just the time, but it's not a specific time in the day. The, what we're really going for with the timed webinar and this automated webinar concept is really isolation. It's not that necessarily it has to be a specific time, but we're looking for isolation of attention. That's the real benefit that we're going for when we do these timed webinars. The problem in reality, like I explained earlier, is that that's not really happening because we're trying to force people into a box that they don't want to go into. Now, they'll go into the box because they think they might get it, but the reality is because of what's going on in their life, they're not going to dedicate that time unless they're one of an extreme few. Well, that means that we're not getting to those other 90 who are interested in what we had enough to go through all the rigmarole that we put them through. And so that's why it's so important that we understand what we're really trying to do with the timed and automated webinar isn't have a specific time for them to go through it as much as it is to isolate their attention. We want to we want to get them away from other distractions. And so that was the mechanism that somebody came up with. It probably worked for a while. It doesn't work so well anymore, as you know. So... Remember that point. What we're looking to do is isolate attention, and we want to use video because video is a high bandwidth, high quality transfer of information that can help someone modify their frame. So those are the two things we're looking for with automated webinars, but we're not really quite getting anymore. And so that's the important part to understand. So that leads to another foundational point that we need to get on the same page about, which is email. E email isn't inherently a bad thing, as I say in the report, but many people hate it. And you probably hate it. And you're not a bad person for hating email because most of us do, you know. Uh, you can go out and find all sorts of articles of people talking about trying to get control of email and how they don't, they wish they had less email, not more. And so when we think about uh, email as our principal uh, media for communicating information beyond that automated webinar, we're really hamstrung. We, we're in a position where we're really losing the power to be able to communicate because we're relying so heavily on a media that people just don't like, right? So I don't know how you handle your email, but the way I handle my email is I'll go through my inbox and I'll kind of skim through. Now, I use in Google Inbox because I have a we use a, a Google organizations for our email. And so I go through that and it has already pre-grouped for me a ton of email into 
promotion, and then updates. And then there's some other ones that they have, but those are the big two that get filled up all the time. So what I'll do first is I'll just skim through the ones that didn't get sucked into those two filters. And I'll just quickly see if there's anything that I need to be doing anything on. And if I, it's something I need to act on immediately, I'll go ahead and open it and deal with it then. If it's something that I could deal with later that's not super urgent but might be important, I'll, I'll put a little pin on it, right? And so that's taken care of. Now I go into the updates, and I'll skim through the updates to see if there's anything important, like a credit card didn't charge properly on one of my subscriptions that I have, and I need to take care of that, or there's something of that nature. And if there is something like that, I'll pin it real quick, and then I'll go ahead and archive the rest of them. And then I'll go to promotions, and I might glance quickly at the subject lines, but then I'm usually just hitting uh, archive on all of those. And then every six months, I go and I take anything that's over like two months old, and I just archive it. I don't even care. Because if it hasn't been dealt with in that time period, then it probably wasn't so urgent that it really mattered. And I don't know that I'm typical, but I'm probably not too far off from a lot of other people. We're all trying to deal with this email mess, and it's not a positive thing. So if that's your only media that you have to rely on, besides this failed attempt at getting them on an automated webinar, good luck. I mean, if you're having success in that scenario, number one, you should be super excited. Because if you can have success in a terrible environment, that means you can have success in, in the environment I'm going to propose very well. You're going to do really great in that. Um, and so that's exciting. But, you know, if you continue to rely just upon these two medias in the way that, that we're talking about right here, it, it's going to get worse and worse. And the problem is if you don't adjust or adapt, then you're going to find yourself in a bad situation instead of a good situation that can get much better if you learn some new strategies. So we're going to get into that. But we have to do one more thing. And that is we have to understand marketing rule number 19 which is decide how you will sell before you decide how you will lead generate. Most people go about it the opposite way. Um, most people go something like this. They, they heard that webinars are the best way to sell, which they are. Webinars is awesome. I love them. But I don't have time to do webinars every day or you know once a week or whatever. I'd rather do automated webinars because it's less work for me and more consistent presentation, right? So what do I need to ask for somebody to join that webinar so I can get as many people joining that webinar as possible? Well, the common uh, knowledge is that I should only ask for email, maybe the name. But now only 20% of the people are showing up to my automated webinar. How can I sell the remaining 80? Well, I only have their email address, so I'll have to sell them by email. So I'll just email them until they buy. And you guys already know the problem with that because of what we talked about up until this point. But years ago, years ago, in a great book, if you haven't read, I highly recommend it. And I know it's been talked about a lot, so maybe because it's been talked about a lot, you might not want to read it. But I would encourage you to read it anyways. It's probably one of the most uh, mind-shifting books I ever read for myself at the time when I read it. I was 19 years old. I was living in Brazil at the time. And it was uh, Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And one of the habits of the highly effective people is beginning with the end in mind. So... And I don't think there's anybody that would argue with that. They, that is a, a great way to do anything. Is begin with the end in mind. Know where you're headed, right? But how often do we ignore that? And the fact that we have to have marketing rule number 19 tells us to the extent that we ignore that. you got to think about the end before you begin. So how will you sell people is a really important question. Now, if you think, well, I'll just sell them by email, I'm just telling you, you're working with two arms strapped behind your back and one leg tied up. I mean, that's how hard it is to do working with email versus adding other ways of communicating with people. So we always want to be thinking about that. How can I, how can I interact with my prospect? How do I communicate with my prospect in a way that I can help them to understand what it is that they can get from what I offer? In other words, how I can modify their frame. And I want to have more options, not less options, when I think about how to solve that problem of communicating the information, the feelings, the beliefs that they need to have in order for them to modify their frame. I don't want to be handicapped in that effort. And the best way to handicap yourself is to do what we just saw right here, which is get end up where you only have email addresses to try and follow up with people. It's terrible. Then I learned this a, uh, a few years back because we had a company where we were paying a lot of money to get people to show up and we get 50 to 100 people three days a week showing up in a hotel a conference room you know in their local market to get three hours of training from one of our trainers 
And at the end of that three hours, we'd ask them to invest in a, some training and a membership with us. And we were doing this all over the country. <clears throat> and we were doing so many of them. We were so focused on getting people in, getting them to show up that that's where all of our attention and effort was. And I don't think that was necessarily a bad thing, but we totally took our eye off the ball of thinking about how do we use all the information that we had? Because we collected all of the contact points that we could think of at the time, which included phone, fax, email, physical address. We had everything. So we could communicate with them, but we didn't even use them. So it was a, kind of a bummer. And because of that, we lost out on $3 million of revenue. We could have had simply by doing one phone call to people who attended but did not buy and that would have been very simple for us to do. We had all that data. We had the attendance data. We had the contact information. We didn't do it. And that was where we started to understand and learn better this concept of knowing and thinking about how you will sell before you start the lead generate. Now, fortunately, we had gathered all that information, so we could have fixed that problem very quickly, but we weren't even thinking about how to sell. And so that was our problem. But I tell you that story just to illustrate that you have to be thinking and be aware of what is the full picture of how I help prospects to be able to accept what we have and part of that is understanding how you're going to communicate with people to modify their frame now I don't have any particular allegiance to one particular method or another my allegiance is to something I call honest profit so honest profit is where you make an exchange of value that is greater than and not equal to because we always want to be greater than the money that we were receiving right? And you do that, if you make a, a profit, that's called an honest profit. I mean, you're doing your part and you're you're uh, giving someone a great value. That doesn't mean discounting or anything like that. It just means you create great value for somebody else and they're happily giving you money. That's a, what I call a really honest profit. Nobody's feeling shortchanged in this exchange. Not you, not them. Everybody's happy. That's our allegiance. We want to make sure that if we're running a business, that it's doing well for us and the people that we love as well as the people that work for us and the people who buy from us. And so that's what we're really looking for. Now that leads me to another story. And this one is about a sales guy that we hired. Now he was all right. In fact, I have to admit that maybe he was better than I thought. But he had a real passion and he knew we could help. But we weren't looking to partner up with anybody. And he saw that, so he offered to go to work for us as a salesperson. And he figured out how to backdoor him. That's why I say he might have been a better salesman than I give him credit for. But he came to us with this idea after he'd been working for us for a while and said, hey, you know, I've got this, this business uh, opportunity that I think is really good and solid and it can help a lot of people. I think you guys can help me to figure that out. So we went to work and we created a marketing funnel and a sales funnel that um, turned out to be really good. And initially we were thinking, hey, let's go with an automated webinar because there's a lot of information we need to communicate about the opportunity that is presented here. And really, we can't do it in just copy. We can't just do it in an ad. We need more time than that. We need about 20 minutes to be able to communicate you know, the, the idea behind this to help someone modify their frame. And we were thinking, do, let's do an automated webinar. But as we considered more and more, and we started to look at all the, the problems that came along with the automated webinar, we thought, hey, maybe there's a different way for us to do this. So our criteria was we want to be able to call prospects. Again, going back to marketing rule number 19. We want to be able to call prospects. So we need to think about that for sales, right? We want to be able to email prospects. Because I, while I don't think email is the greatest media in the world, it is a useful media. And there's a, a lot of things that we can do with it that are very powerful, especially in combination with other medias. So we want to be able to email prospects. We'd also like to be able to text prospects if they give us permission. Because we feel like texting is a great way to get out of the, the chaos of email and isolate ourselves in a more... Uh, less, I should say, a less competitive environment, a place where we could do much better because nobody else is really playing there. So we want to be able to text message our prospects with their permission. And we need to deliver a video message. So we, when, and notice what we're doing here. We're not saying, we're not getting caught up in a particular technology. We're looking at what is the solution that we need? What is the thing that will actually solve the problem? Not what technology do I know about that will do that? We're looking for actual elements of a complete solution once we identified what the core problem was that we're trying to to overcome. So then we said we'd really like to deliver that video message in isolation going back to what we had identified that was good about automated webinars if they worked right if they worked the way that we thought we'd isolate that video in that time for them. So I want to isolate that video message and I want the lowest competition rate possible. I want some level of permanency you know in terms of where that is in in their world so we can increase the odds of the video being consumed. 
and we'd like the prospect to signal when they're ready for a call so or you know the t we give them the, the the call to action directly but in this case there was going to be a call involved because there were definitely some things that the person need to figure out before they could say yes so we wanted them to signal when they're ready for the call now think about the the experiences you've had with sales have they been cold calls have you had to call somebody and then convince them that they should be thinking about the problem that you're solving right now or have you had to kind of force that to happen now imagine the contrast of that versus having people signal to you hey I want to talk to you about this and what if you could build out a system that actually accomplished all of that so it would take care of all that in an automated fashion so all you have to do is just sit there and wait for a text message or a notification to come in that says hey call this person they're ready to talk like doesn't that sound like the ideal type of business that this is something that we designed and organized because we've done enough business and we've seen enough people struggle with building and, and creating new businesses that we've identified the factors that you really want to keep you engaged in that business and really excited about building it and make it somewhat predictable because predictability is an important part in business that's why so many people go out of business is because they lose cash flow and so we want to make sure that they had good cash flow and it would be a good experience right because we're partners in it we have a vested interest so we took all our design requirements and that is where we started our journey we started looking about okay, where do we find people to start putting them into this this place this funnel and for me the very best starting point is Facebook now I'm sure I don't have to explain very much about Facebook, but the reality is nobody even comes close with the demographic data that you can get and the tools that you can get for uh, finding people who are your ideal prospect and then be able to track those results and everything. Nobody even comes close. And you don't have to get super sophisticated, but there's some, some art to it, maybe a little bit of science, but it's such a powerful tool that Facebook definitely was going to be our go point, our start point. Now, to, to say that, I also have to add in this caveat that we did use other sources, and they were much more expensive, but we went and found places where we knew our ideal customer was hanging out, and we paid to play in those areas as well. Now, nothing came close to touching the effectiveness of the Facebook ad in terms of cost and reliability and predictability, but we still did other things because one is always the worst number in business. But we're going to be talking principally about the Facebook ad in, in this uh, report because it was so predictable and so powerful and generated like 95% of the leads that we generated that we're going to be talking about in terms of uh, this case study. So... Typically, when you use Facebook ads, and you've probably experienced this a million times, there'll be a Facebook ad and then a link to a landing page, and then copy to convince you to fill out the registration form, and then they'll deliver the material or you know get you to the you know the the page where you sit and wait for a couple of hours until that webinar is going to go, or you know they send you an email with that information. But even that simple four-step process introduces a ton of what I call friction points. Now, friction is a term from physics that obviously means when two things are kind of rubbing up against each other and it creates heat or energy that also slows down momentum. And principally, when we're talking about friction points, we're talking about momentum. Because what we don't want to do is introduce any friction points that can be eliminated in the process of getting them to that video. So we want to do everything we can to eliminate those those friction points in there. And the first friction point in this typical scenario that a lot of people do is the landing page. Now you might not think about this, but um, I've got a really good friend who does these huge launches. And when you're doing huge launches, one of the benefits you have is you can learn a lot because you get to see a, a ton of data in a condensed period of time. And you're able to do some isolation to be able to identify what is causing um, something to work or not work. And one of the things that he revealed to me is that if a page load time is greater than two seconds, your conversion drops dramatically. Now think about that. If your page load time is greater than two seconds, and two seconds goes one, two, right? Then your conversions drop dramatically. So our very first step off of a lead, uh, a Facebook ad is clicking to a landing page on a server. And, you know, I've been working in technology for the past decade, and all I can say is that one thing that is consistent about technolo technology and servers is that they're inconsistent. <laughs> 
And for the most part, it's very difficult to get to that two second load time. It's very, it's possible. In fact, they know some guys that offer some advanced technology that's very expensive and they can, they'll get you there. And there's some things you can do that might help along with that. But most people are using services like ClickFunnels or lead pages or whatever that, you know, things like that. And it's very difficult when you're offering a software as a service to be able to have those load times consistently quick, especially when they're using the kind of editors they're using to allow you to build stuff. It just doesn't lend itself to that kind of speed. So we're already at a disadvantage because we've introduced a friction point at the very beginning of the process. And if you've ever bailed on a page after you clicked on an ad because it took too long to load, then you have personal experience with what this is, this friction point. And I think we all have because it's just is so common. So that's the first friction point. The next friction point we have is actually copy. Now, we don't think about it too frequently because mostly, um, especially copywriters, imagine everybody wants to consume their copy. Now, the real good ones, they understand this idea that copy um, is a friction point. It is something that will not necessarily be consumed. And so we have to use it wisely. But actually, large amounts of copy off of one of these ads on Facebook can be a huge detriment. Now, it doesn't have to be a lot of copy either. It could just be bad copy. It could be confusing copy. So there's all sorts of places where we can go wrong with the copy. So the copy comes uh, becomes a friction point. Now, in the report, I introduced another concept I think is important and extends beyond this topic that we're talking about with the death of automated webinars. And that is that the map is not the train. So your map of reality is one that you've built over experiences that you've had with interacting with the world. And you know we use our eyes and we use our ears and we use our, our senses of feeling as well as our senses of emotion, right, to start to create a map of the world. And that map includes other people and things around us. And because our all of our senses are taking in so much information, the map that we actually reference is more like an actual paper map than the real world. It has... Uh, a lot of things deleted out of it, right? Because if you look at a map, whether it's on your phone or a paper map, you see some information, but you don't see an exact replica of the world around you. It's a reduced um, reference point to the, the actual world. And it's important for us to remember that our perception of reality is not reality. It's merely our perception of reality. And sometimes we use that, that map and we think of it as the terrain. And so we think, hey, I like doing this, so everybody likes doing this. Or, you know, copy is a good thing, and that may be our map, but the reality is it's not. And it can be, but it's not always. And in these kind of scenarios where we're trying to get somebody to trust us enough to give their contact information, we have to recognize that the copy that does that work is in the ad. The copy that we put on landing page is simply there because we think it needs to be there in order for us to get them to take the next step. And that's partially true because we created friction with them getting to the page. Now we have to re-engage them and then overcome the friction of that. And we do it by introducing yet another friction point of the copy. So copy is another friction point. Now if we go back up to our list, then we have to get them to give us that information and fill in the information. Now that's another one that people don't think about. But 90 to 95% of all of Facebook's traffic that you're going to get to your ad is mobile. It's like almost all of it. And so the interaction or the experience that you're creating, you have to think about what it's like on the mobile phone. Now, how many of you, like, do you love um, typing on your phone? I have to be honest. I really don't. And it's probably because I have these huge thumbs. I mean, I'm 6'7", and I weigh like 260, so I'm not a tiny guy. And my my fingers are huge. And even with the these big phones, the keyboard isn't big enough, right? It's weird to type in there, and I always mess up. And so, the, you know, that's kind of a cumbersome process. So we have these web forms that people have to actually type stuff in. And, you know, frequently, a lot of these services don't even modify the keyboard to be the easy one, right? So if you're asking for a phone number, they don't pull up that nice big digit keyboard. They bring up the, the typing keyboard for letters and stuff. And it doesn't make sense to a person that they've got to go fight with those little tiny buttons to get the phone number put in there. And frequently, that leads to bad information if they fill it out at all. It's very common for people to bail, not because they're not interested, but because the hurdle of having to deal with the form is too much. And if we did things right and, and, uh, and we used marketing rule number 19, then we're going to be asking for more than an email address. So we've created more friction by doing the right things, supposedly. So then we got this other dilemma. So with all these problems and all these friction points, it's like, well, what do you do? 
And um, you know, and if you think that that these little things don't make that big of a difference, it leads me to another story I'd like to tell you, which is I've only had one private client ever, and this private client's a pretty big one. Just to give you an idea, they spend like eight hundred thousand a month on their marketing spend. So it just gives you some, and they're profitable, very profitable. So that gives you some idea of the magnitude that they work at. And um, they were the reason that we were engaged with them is because uh, I created a, a one-click upsell solution and they this is a very important part this is where they get all their profit of from their e-commerce is on the upsells and so you know our work together was very important and one day they asked me to make a modification to an upsell and somebody else had set it up for them but things weren't going great so that's why they had asked me to come in I made the modification and as I was in there I noticed that they had turned off a confirmation button now this was when they, the person clicked buy a little pop-up confirmation would come and say you're about to add this to your order click OK to continue or cancel the you know, to go back. And I, I put that there because some people had complained about with the one click upsell that people would order accidentally because it was so easy to order and, and they wanted that confirmation pop up in there. And so I was like, oh, somebody messed up here. I'll fix this and I'll put that confirmation back to work. I turned it back on. And uh, within 30 minutes, I got, received a phone call and they're like, hey, whatever you did, undo it and then we'll talk. And so I went in and I undid that. Um, the work that I had done and then they got on the phone with me and they said hey what did you add the confirmation button back in and I said yeah I had the confirmation pop up back in they said well that kills our sales by 50 percent so in other words it's a 50 percent reduction simply because the person that clicked on yes to buy had to click on yes one more time now think about that a split second evaluation was enough to kill a sale now, if, if you think it takes effort to get someone to, to order something, it's much easier to get an upsell than it is to have somebody fill out a form in the first place. So just think about how minute the friction can be to like dramatically kill your, your prospects. And then think about if you're currently making money on the efforts that you're doing, if you can just do a few things to reduce these, these friction points, how much better will it be? So this is where Facebook lead ads come in. And this is what we figured that would be a solution that reduced the friction points. And now look at, maybe you've used or tried lead ads in the past and you're like, no, they don't work for me. And as my old man would always say, whatever you're not up on, you're down on. And I don't mean this to be like judgmental of your, you know, your view of lead ads, but I'll just tell you, if you tried it and it didn't work for you, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. It just means that you didn't know how to use it right. And uh, again, we can overcome that. You know, those things can all be overcome. That's what, why we're going through this report together is I want you to understand how to make that happen. So what we started doing is we started using lead ads. And there's some tricks to it. you got to understand it. And if you understand it right, then it becomes very powerful. And you're going to see how powerful when I give you these numbers from this report. But we ask for email, full name, and phone number always. We never do any less than that. We always ask for at least that. Now, there's probably some value to asking for some other information that is going to be in there, but we always ask for for those three. In fact, zip code might not be a bad idea. We didn't do it, so I'm not going to talk about that as something you should do because I'm going to talk about what we've actually done and what we got results from. Okay, so <clears throat> great part about the lead ad is Facebook fills in all this information for you. And probably on like most everybody, they have full name, email, and phone number already associated with a Facebook account. So that means the person doesn't have to think about filling out the form. The other part is this Facebook lead ad, if you're not familiar with it, it is instantly loaded inside of uh, Facebook's app because Facebook's made it so that it'll load super quick. And so it reduces that friction point. It's always like uh, one second or sub one second load time. And it's already loaded with all their information in it, so they don't have to think about it at all. And so it's very, very fast. And so that's what we love about the lead ad, is it removes the friction point of a loading time, and it removes the friction friction point of filling out the form. And even on top of all that, it's you know not another service that we have to go out and configure. It eliminates the need for us to write a bunch of copy for that page, so it speeds up our setup process as well. So there's a bunch of things that it does very quickly for us, and that's why we love lead ads. Now, <clears throat> once you get a lead through lead ad, then you got to post it. You know what they do is they'll put it in a CSV file. For us personally, we have that pushed over to our CRM, and in our CRM, that's where we're having it do the next part but the next part is really important and that is this question we ask and <clears throat> we either post it as a question or a statement we try a number of different things it doesn't seem to matter too much how you do it it all works pretty well but like in this case I'm saying send me the video 
via text message. So what you, if you haven't figured out yet, what we're doing is we're using a lead ad. We're going to ask them for information, and then we're going to send them the video. Now, we, we ask this question of, can I send you the video via text message? And we give them a yes, no. So they can either say yes or no. Now, you're probably wondering, well, this seems like this would be more friction, not less friction. We've been talking all about friction points. Well, what we found in this particular case is we're getting leads for sub $2. In this particular case, I'm going to be talking about. We generated 10,000 leads, so it's a pretty good sample to be able to go off of. And of those, 80% said yes to receiving a text message with the video. 80%. So that's pretty good. That's, and that tells you something very interesting because why, what was, whenever you're asking for information, there's always got to be a reason that you're asking for the information, right? So a lot of people only ask for email because I, and I know this because I talk to a lot of marketers and when I say, hey, you should be asking for phone number two, they're like, well, people will give me fake phone numbers. Well, that's a very valid concern, isn't it? But when you give a reason for why you need the phone number, it's very interesting what happens. I'm going to kind of jump ahead here because I'm so excited about it. I want you to know about it. So of these 10,000 plus uh, leads that we generated with this approach, this is what's really interesting and happened. The We received over 99.87% valid phone numbers. And like 99.7% of those were all mobile phone numbers. Now, of all the connection points that we have today to have with a person, the most unique contact information for anybody is their mobile phone number. Because chances are, and this is true for almost everybody, they only have one cell phone number. Now, a lot of people that work for big companies maybe have a second phone provided for them, but they're not using that work phone cell phone number in their personal Facebook account. So we have probably the most unique contact information by getting the cell phone number. And it opens up the ability for us to text if we get permission. For example, send me the video via text message, yes, no. If they say yes, then we can send them that text message. So my CRM or my you know, marketing automation platform will then send that text message to the prospect and it will give a link to the video. Now that link to the video is also trackable. So it's giving me all these ways to track the interaction. I can kind of follow the progress of a prospect through this, this funnel. And then I'm going to have them watch a video. And in this video, at the end of this video, what we do, because we want them to signal, remember that, that final thing that I asked them for, is I wanted them to signal to us that they were ready for a call or they wanted some way to say, hey, I'm ready to take action directly. And so what we did is in our video, we asked them to reply to our text. Now, we'd already texted most of them. For those that we hadn't texted, the, that 20%, we gave them the phone number and, the, and you know where to text to. And we said, on a scale of 1 to 10, how interested are you to learn more? And they would then text in. If they texted the 8+, plus, then we were immediately setting up a call. If it was less than that, we had other things that we did. But just so you understand this method, we are not calling people without the permission. They're telling us, hey, I'm ready to talk to you. And this was fantastic because what we had done prior to this was very interesting. And I'm sure you've heard of this um, report that came out from Harvard. Harvard had this report where they said, if you call within five minutes from a web form lead, the chances of you having the sale are astronomically higher than if you wait like even 10, 15, or an hour after they've submitted the form. And so we took and we got a sales form. We had six guys calling on these leads as soon as they came through. And we found out that it wasn't working really great. People were not buying. And um, we were kind of racking our brains like, well, how come this isn't working? I mean, the Harvard study said that. It's good reason to believe that. We've heard that confirmed by a lot of other people. Why is this not working? And it's important to understand that Someone that goes and seeks through the internet and finds your website and fills out a web form after going through all the garbage they have to is probably more likely in a position where their frame is already prepared to make a decision. Um, when we have somebody that's socially on Facebook, kind of zooming through their newsfeed, and then we inject an idea in front of them, and then that captures their attention, and they go through that process, this is more of we're capturing their attention. There's more likely that there's more time that and information that is needed to prepare them for the sale than otherwise. And so what's fascinating here is that we stopped making those phone calls immediately. We got rid of the sixth sales guy. 
we went back just to our sales guy that was our partner on this and we said okay when they text eight plus go ahead and you know text them back and set up a time and then have a phone call with them and so we did that and they had 10 times we had 10 times the sales off of this guy, one guy working alone than we did with the six guys calling immediately and think about that less time less effort less money being spent and way greater results okay so fewer calls fewer man hours and more sales this kind of sounds like that uh, you know that that we really nailed it on that objective of having more profit and I didn't mention this earlier in this video but in the report I do that what you're going for when you do an automated webinar is you're trying to get more profit or more time or more freedom or a combination of all three and so that's kind of that's what I, I throw it when I'm thinking about this honest profit concept is I'm trying to get more time and more freedom for myself or for the people that we're working with that you know, we're putting this together for them and so that f former salesperson turned partner ended up hiring a single salesperson to take his place and continue to get great results and now he just sits around and studies I guess and you know whatever it's his deal um, as long as we continue to get results that's all we're looking for but he accomplished the goal of time and freedom that's pretty fantastic that was zero to forty thousand per month in just sixty days with that, this whole approach and so just imagine how this would work for you if you've already been getting good results with automated webinars now if you haven't had good results with automated webinars don't lose heart because it's a very tough environment if you were winning I mean it would be phenomenal but even if you weren't this is going to be way better for you now that 20% of the people who said no don't text me do you think that we don't sell those people that they don't you know want to buy well the interesting part is, is we went and ran those 20% those 2000 plus numbers through a process that we have that tells us if a phone number is a cell phone number a landline or a fake number and what we found out was of all the 2000 plus uh, phone numbers 163 were uh, landlines, 33 were fake numbers, and 1,917 were real mobile numbers. So think about that. Just because we asked that question of, can I text you the video link, we were able to get 99.87 or something like that percent cell phone numbers in our list. And so that opens up all sorts of opportunities for us. Now, if you're, if you're getting done with this video, that's okay. You can go ahead and stop. But I want to share with you one other important point. And this is a concept that we call uh, attention credit. And a lot of people, a lot of marketers don't think about this. But every time that you interact with somebody, now this isn't just in marketing. This is in life in general. Every time you interact with somebody, you're either getting something out of it or you're not. And you're making a judgment at an unconscious level about how much attention do I want to give this person in the future? And you're leaving every interaction with an intention to give them more attention or less attention. So somebody that's really annoying to you, like if you found my voice super annoying, which is likely, I mean, anybody can have an annoying voice to somebody else. It's all figured, you know, subjective. But if, if you found my voice really annoying and the information I was giving you not to be valuable or you didn't think I was credible, then when you left that interaction, you would say, I'm not giving that guy as much attention or any attention in the future. But if you found what I was teaching you to be valuable and helpful and like eye-opening and made you feel curious or interested or even excited about what you were doing or the possibilities of what you could do, you probably would give more attention in the future. And every time we have an interaction with somebody in marketing or sales, we're either getting more attention credit or we're spending attention credit and we're losing more in the future. It's, it's either one or the other. We're either getting more or we're getting less. And people don't think about this and so they, they get their email editor out there and they, they fire up 10 emails. They're like, I'm just going to pound this dude and eventually they're going to buy. They don't understand that each email that you send is either adding to or taking away from the attention credit that they have with that contact, with that prospect, with that person. And because of that, we, we take these seemingly cheap and inexpensive medias like email and we use them abusively. We don't think about how am I adding value to that person? How am I making that person feel like they want to spend more time interacting with me or not? So th there's this guy who um, I met and he said, yeah, I got this. I'm on this email list and this guy sends me like seven emails a day. 
And I'm like, oh, that would never be interested in that. And then he started reading about the emails, and I thought, oh, okay, so that email is actually engaging or interesting or helpful, enjoyable or otherwise pleasant. So it makes it so that the person receiving it doesn't mind receiving another one. So the amount of interaction that we have, if it's adding to, because it's engaging, interesting, helpful, enjoyable, or otherwise pleasant, it increases our attention credit and it allows people to want to interact with us more. And so that's really what we want to be going for whenever we're interacting with people. So when we send these text messages out, they have the link. We want to make sure that whatever we're delivering in that is engaging, interesting, helpful, enjoyable, or otherwise pleasant. If we do a follow-up text message, you know, to say, hey, how's the video coming along? Did you have any questions came up about that? That may be what we're trying to accomplish in terms of, you know, finding that out. But we need to think about how can we do that in a way that's engaging, interesting, helpful, enjoyable, or otherwise pleasant. So we're adding to the attention credit, not taking away from it. Because if you want to have more success in all of your marketing, you have to think about how can you create a positive experience where that person wants to engage with you more frequently, not less frequently. And so that's constantly the question we need to be thinking about. Okay, well, that was the final point I wanted to get across to you in this message. Um, you now understand why automated webinars are dead and that there's a lot to be gained from this new method that we, we've been using. It's been very successful for us. I'm sure it can be successful for you. If you have any questions or you need help um, in the report, there's a link. It says text convert to 760-621-8199. If you're on a smartphone and you're looking at that report, you can tap on that. They'll open up your texting application with that keyword right in there. You can just hit send, and then that'll get us connected. If you have other questions and you want to text those, you can just text those in general to us at that same number, or you can call us at that number. And you know, if you need help with this, we uh, offer a variety of services and tools that help out. Um, I have the list of the tools that I personally use, that we use, so that you can kind of look at those and reference those. But... Again, just make sure that when you're interacting with people, you're always adding to that attention credit and not taking away. Uh, if you have, again, any questions about what we covered in this report or maybe even challenges to it, if you don't think it's the, you know, we did something wrong here, love to hear back from you because we always like to sharpen our game. But if you do have questions about how to implement it, hopefully you got some good ideas and you have kind of a concept, a rough concept of how to do this. But if you do need any help, let us know. We'd be happy to at least point you in the right direction if we can't help you ourselves. So my name is Ryan Chapman. I appreciate your time and attention on this. Hopefully I added to our attention credit between you and I, and we'll see you later.